G'day, welcome to Scrooge's Workshop. The compressor I use for sandblasting just doesn't have enough volume to give me good results. So I picked up this compressor with the intention of removing the pump only and setting that up on my original compressor and running two pumps. But things took a change as I went along and you'll see what I mean as we go. I found this one online and the seller wanted $100 for it. But the poor thing was so sad it took forever to build up pressure. And the guy that owned it had never looked after it, never done any maintenance on it. But I think I knew what was wrong, so I took a chance. I offered him $50 for it, and he jumped at it. So it's mine. Ready? So bear with me, and I'll show you what I mean. That compressor's running now. And look how slowly it's building up pressure. Painfully slow. Even Lucy's wondering what's wrong with it. And as we're finally getting up to pressure, you can really hear the thing starting to protest and slow right down. So what's going on? So here's the first problem. The unloader valve is leaking. The second problem which is causing most of the noise, is the bearings in this electric motor are completely shot. Although well, it's still spinning at 2900 RPM, which is correct. But this is the main reason the compressor pump's slowing down. Those belts have bottomed out on the pulley, so there's no grip left. The pulleys actually work on the side, not the bottom of the belt, and they're extremely loose, so that pulley will need replacing. So all the slipping and the buggered bearings cause a lot of heat. So I'll touch it with my finger, Yep, too hot to touch, so I'll touch it again just to make sure. Up on the bench now, I've got three of the four main components of your compressor. The electric motor on the left, the pump on the right, and sitting on top of the pump is the cutoff switch and unloader valve. The electric motor was made in Australia by Crompton Parkinson for compact compressors. And I was originally going to scrap it, but once I cleaned it up, I realised that it just needed two new bearings, which I happened to have floating around anyway. So I cleaned up the rotor on the lathe, put the motor back together again, and it worked beautifully, smooth and quiet. I found even the run and start capacitors were still in great condition. So the only thing left wrong with it really was the heavy corrosion on the outside. It was pretty good on the inside. And I've got the gear to clean that up, and I'll show you that later. Moving on to the pump, it's a Clisby pump. Again, made for compact compressors. Very good brand. Clisby have been around for donkey's years. You can see it's got two different ratings on it, depending on what size pulley the electric motor has on it. Pretty clear here, this is one of the air intakes. No maintenance, no one's ever bothered cleaning the air filter, so she sucked in a lot of junk. That said, the bores look pretty good. Not too much wrong with those, although the pistons have seen better days. A bit of scoring on those. And the top of the piston just wiped clean. But these aren't like an internal combustion engine. There's no serious pressure in these. So it'll last forever. I figured I could probably even clean up the original pressure gauge. Uh, it's made in Germany. But I needed to test it against a known gauge first. And the best way to do that was put it up against this uh, Norgan gauge, which is made in England. And there's about 5 psi difference between them, and 5 psi I can live with, close enough for me. Thankfully these old gauges are pretty easy to get apart, and you can see the face cleaned up beautifully. And I managed to polish up the cracked plastic, and just put the crack in an inconspicuous spot. Even the emergency relief valve is compact branded, and it has a manual override if you need that too. Next up, the wheels went for a spin on the lathe. Just cleaned them up a bit, made them look a little bit better. And then I moved on to the Norgan water separator that came with the compressor. It was in pretty sad state, but again, it all cleaned up okay. It was a clear plastic cup that took the most work to get it to look good. So now after all that stuff was out of the way, it was onto the biggest piece, obviously the tank. This compressor was incredibly heavy, even for two of us to lift it, it was super heavy. I ended up using my hoist to get it out of the car. It had me wondering, just how heavy is this 50 year old tank? So I decided to throw it on the scales and just see what it weighs. This hoist I'm using is an old electric 
patient lift from a hospital or somewhere. It cost me about ten dollars, probably ten years ago. Still working fine. That's where my torch went. So 53 kilo. So I compared that to a more modern tank. It's about the same size. And I put that on the scales just to have a look because it doesn't feel anywhere near as heavy. And it came in at just 18 kilos. So that's nearly 40 kilos lighter. This is inside the tank. The seam at the bottom is on the left, but as you can see, the gunk's distributed fairly evenly around the whole inside. So the best way for me to clean this, I figured, was electrolysis. So I've got myself a piece of pipe there, and that's a rubber grommet to stop the pipe touching the side of the tank, and it's just off the bottom of the tank as well. That way we don't get a dead short. Next, it was filled almost all the way up with water. I added a couple of litres of old drain cleaner that had been hanging around the garage for a couple of years to act as an electrolyte. This is how thick the pipe is originally, probably 3 or 4 mil. I just used a 12 volt battery charger for power and here you can see it just dissolving all the rust out of the tank. It was probably like this for about two days, just this rusty gunk coming out. At the end of two days it stopped producing the rusty colour and was producing this black gunky stuff coming out of it. Every day or so, every twice a day I would hose it off and top up the water in the tank. Finally after about seven or eight days it stopped bubbling away but that could have been that the electrolyte ended up too diluted. But once it got like this I figured it's finished, switched it off and drained the tank. This is the pipe I was using as the anode, which was connected to the positive of the battery terminal. As you can see, after a week, the electrolysis will chew right through that piece of pipe. Here's that piece of pipe as I removed it from the tank. That's why you really want to get your anode and your cathode set up properly. Look what it's done to that pipe. Just a quick reminder, this is what we started with. This was inside the tank and all that gunk had to come out. And here it is cleaned. Let me explain a few things. Firstly, it did a better job towards the top of the tank than it did at the bottom. So we're looking from the bottom hole up towards the top lid. The grey on the right hand side is actually bare metal and you can see the top lid is almost all bare metal and it came out quite good. If I'd wanted a better job, I would have refilled it and put the electrode in from the other end. As it is, I'm quite happy with it. I just wanted to see what it would be like inside. While looking okay is one thing, I really needed to test it. So I rigged up my own hydrostatic test for this. You can do the same thing as well. It's not hard. I simply closed off all the ports and set up a fitting and adapted my pressure washer to it. Just to note, that tank is absolutely full of water, there's no air in there whatsoever. I gave the trigger a couple of squirts, let it rest for a few minutes just to see what would happen. I left the gauge and the pressure gun connected, and left it like this when I went and had lunch. So you're looking at about 45 minutes, it was sitting like this. It didn't move the whole time. And just to give you some idea, that needle is sitting between the K and the P in black at the bottom there. And on the gauge, I figured that would come out at about 300 PSI, which is over double the working pressure of this tank. Held it for that long. Not scientific, but I was confident with it. So with that out of the way, I turned my attention to the worst job, and that's cleaning up the outside of the tank. To help me clean the tank properly, I cut the support bracket for the pump and the electric motor off and put it in this tub. You can see I've made a a metal frame around the bottom of the tub. That's helps distribute the power equally and just gives the parts a better clean. I also just connected it straight to a car battery I had. It's more aggressive and will flatten the battery after a few hours, but it's a lot faster too. Here's that big bracket after a couple of hours in the tub. 
and you can see here the beauty of electrolysis anywhere that had sound paint hasn't been touched but anywhere that was a bit rusty it's eaten through the rust and I'm back to bare metal cleaning the tank was a matter of elbow grease paint stripper and a wire wheel the pieces of tape there are to stop the paint sticking to where I want to weld that bracket back on after it's all painted up. Looking here you can see the manufacture date of that tank, the 21st of August 1974. So this tank, this whole compressor is 48 years old. Here you can see the tank and the support bracket, both in a good thick coat of red primer before the final colour goes on. Here's the finished product. You can see how clear that water separator came out on the front. That come up good. The motor's painted blue simply because I had some blue paint on my shelf. The only thing I bought was some new red spray paint. I had to change the pressure regulator cutoff switch because I couldn't get the old one to work properly. I did try. Compaq are still manufacturing compressors up there in Brisbane, Australia. And you can still buy this same model today. There was still one more thing I wanted, just to give it that finishing touch. So I wrote to Compaq and told them I was overhauling one of their old compressors from 1974. They wrote back really enthusiastically that somebody was actually bothering to rebuild a compressor rather than just scrap it and go and purchase a new one. And they were good enough to send me four new labels for free. Two for this one and two for Big Brother that I'm using already. Here it is running. You can see that gauge come up pretty good too. Pretty happy with that. There's Big Brother in the background. And I'll just explain how I've got these two set up. So my garage is split into two 16 amp circuits and there's one 32 amp circuit in the meter box. So I plug the big one into one circuit and the smaller one into the other circuit. Now when they shut off it's not a problem, but I don't want them to start at exactly the same time. So I've actually got a 5 pound differential between each compressor. So one will kick in at 85 pounds, the other one will kick in at 80 pounds. That way they never start at the same time, but they do run very well together and my sandblasting now is incredible. So why the change from my original plan to just run two pumps? Several reasons really. It was an evolution rather than a sudden change of heart to run the second pump on one compressor would have meant a much bigger motor that i probably couldn't have run on 240 volt power probably would have had to burn a three phase which i don't have this also proved to be more versatile for me i run the rest of my workshop including my powder coating off the small compressor only i don't need to run the big one which of course is a lot more economical power wise Cost was a factor. This compressor cost me almost nothing to recondition, except for a can of red paint. Whereas to buy a bigger motor, big enough to run the two pumps, would have been quite expensive. So I'm in front financially doing it this way as well. My last, but probably a bit morbid, reason was that if something happens to me, nobody's going to want to buy some backyard homemade abomination of a compressor. Whereas this way, I've got two good compressors that can be sold. So this is the business end of how all the air comes together. It looks like a dog's breakfast, but it's pretty straightforward. The two yellow lines are the input, one each from each compressor, and the blue line on the right goes back to feed the rest of my workshop. The blue line on the left with the big loop in it, the air from the compressors goes through that line, through that uh, radiator system as an after cooler, comes back through the water trap and off into the sandblaster. The original compressor I was using for sandblasting is the one at the back, the triple cylinder one. That's also made by Compaq. I bought that about four years ago for I think about $100. And all I've had to do to it when I, since I've got it is service it. It's been brilliant. If you're interested, they still sell a very similar model. So this two compressors bizzo was all very good in theory. But how does it actually perform? Well you may have noticed in the original pictures that the belt cover only had a pretty rough paint job on it and that was because I'd already tried to sandblast it with the single compressor 
and it was really struggling to get the paint and the rust off. So here's how it works now. No funny business, this is real time, not sped up at all. This is how it looked after I previously sandblasted it. Uh, you can see it, the single compressor wasn't doing a very good job. That fluffy stuff I'm hitting now is actually contact cement, and that's what's down the bottom under the gun at the moment. Don't know how that got in there, but it would not come off. But the, uh, the twin compressors, getting it off beautifully, and look at it chew through the paint and the rust here. Fantastic. So you can clearly hear in this video the sandblaster running and ripping the paint off. But believe it or not, I'm standing right next to both of those compressors while they're running. They're extremely quiet. So in total, this job took me about two weeks. And while I was doing it, my wife said to me, why don't you look around and see if there's something already like this? You can't be the first one to think of twin compressors. And of course I'm not. Here's one made by Compaq, for example. It's twin everything. Twin tanks, twin pumps, twin electric motors, twin regulators, and you need, just like me, twin circuits to set it up. But it's already built, so you don't have to muck around like I did. The only problem is my two compressors owe me about $200. One of these, five or six thousand. I just couldn't justify that. But if you haven't got three foes, then one of these might just be your answer. Now, of course, I've got to repeat the whole process on this one. Not looking forward to it, but I'll get it done. Cheers, and thanks for watching.